Okay, so we're now, uh, we've been in a series called Heart for the House, and this is not just a, a series, you know, like a normal series. This is one that's got a very big practical application to it. But what's been great about this is that for the first time ever as a church, we've been able to say, hey, let's, let's talk about money a little bit and not from a standpoint of uh, we're broke and if you don't give, we close down. Like our finances are, are okay, like we're doing a decent job here. What this is, is this is us. I'm asking us as a church to have a heart for this house here. And the way that this works from like a pastor's perspective, from my perspective, is I, I go to God and I start praying like a year ago. Like, Lord, what would you have for South Point next year? What is it that you want for us? What do we need to do or, or how do we grow? What's a word for us? And God said, okay, I, I think it's time for you guys to do one of these Heart for the House campaigns. Okay, God, what do you want us to do? You know, we kind of talked about it. Our elders, we talked about it a little bit. And then it just, it just kept coming up over and over and over. And I kept praying, God, don't, you know, sure, that's what you want to do. And God just kept affirming it. So we put this number uh, on our hearts, 2.55 million rand. And what this is, is this is the amount of debt that we have as a, as a church, uh, which I think is pretty good. Some of you guys are more in debt than this, you know. Um, but two, like I say, two is not a big number, right? It's only one bigger than one, and one's only one bigger than zero. So two is basically like a nothing number. This could be 10 or 20 or 160, you know, but it's, but it's two. And, and, and God's, he's, Chris, I want the debt gone. Pay the debt off. Okay, what's the one-year plan for that? No, Chris, pay it off at the end of the month. And so that is what we're doing here. We're going to pay off at the end of this month. 2.55 uh, million rand in debt. And, and here's, here's why this is so significant. There's several reasons why this is a big deal. Uh, one is it, it gets the church debt free, I mean, which is a good thing. We, we want that position as a church. But there's more to it than just that. See, God's given us something that we feel like is impossible. God, gave, he, God has said, Chris, because it usually starts with, with me, Chris... Uh, here's something, and then I say to God, that, that feels impossible. And then I take things to you guys or to our elders, and I say, okay, here's something that God is talking about and saying, and other people say, okay, that's impossible. That feels impossible. But it, it's actually it's not impossible. See, we, tend to, to, we tend to confuse two words here. So let us not confuse unexplainable with impossible. So let, let us not confuse what's unexplainable with something that's impossible. So here's how that works. Uh, if, if I think that how could, how could it be done, how can I understand how something can be done, that, that means that that thing is probably impossible. But when we factor in the God into it, when we factor God into it, we bring Him into account, it's actually not impossible, it's just unexplainable. So if you take the unexplainable love of Jesus and apply it to your life, guess what? It's not impossible for you to get saved and go to heaven. It's not impossible for you to have forgiveness of your sins. It's not impossible for you to change and break habits and, and change things for the next generation. It just is unexplainable because you can't explain the love of God. We can't, we'll never understand why God looked at Jesus and said, go down there and, and make sure that when they, go, when they die, they can go to heaven. And they're, oh God, you know, they're pretty messed up down there. God said, I know, they're the most messed up that they could ever be. I gave them everything that they could ever need, and they messed up the whole thing. Now they're full of sin, and they'll never be able to be in my presence. And unexplainably, Jesus came down as a baby, and he, he grew up, and he died, and he resurrected for our sins. You know, the resurrection seems impossible. A man dies, sits in a tomb, he rises after three days, ascends into heaven, starts a movement that's continued to change our world. That, that, that feels like that should be impossible, but it's not. It's unexplainable. So in your life, you know, it, it could be the 2.5 million rand that we're wanting to pay off at the end of the month. You know, if you weigh that up against the resurrection, you know, you, the resurrection is, is pretty crazy, you know. It's easy to say, oh, that, that, that's, that could be impossible. Before it happened, even the disciples were like, dude's dead. That's the end of this thing. The movement is over. And you, you weigh up two million rand against the resurrection. That two million rand is nothing. 
That's not impossible. You know, when, when, you, when you weigh up the, the love of Christ, the fact that Christ loves you so much that he gave his life for you, that, that should be impossible. You could never do enough to get to heaven. You could never do enough to be forgiven. You can never do enough. You can, you can never do enough. But the, what we think would be impossible, which is actually unexplainable, because it's the God element gets thrown into our lives, that God element brings salvation. That God element makes what we think is impossible, possible, but unexplainable. And I don't want what we do here to ever become explainable. I don't want a lot of explainable in how God moves in this church right here. I want to keep us in the unexplainable. There's a quote uh, that I read a long time ago. Uh, if your dreams are not offensive, no, sorry. If your dreams are, I can't remember the quote now. If, <laughs> yeah, if your dreams are not impossible to you, then they're offensive to God. Something like that. You know, and, and I don't think God gets offended, but I think God is saying, come on, dream more. Find what is impossible to you, and let me show you that it's actually just unexplainable. And the way that we usher in this unexplainability into our lives and into you know, church or into our jobs is we do this phrase that we've been talking about the whole series. We do what God says, and we see what He does. That's how we bring that in. So we don't worry about whether or not we think it's possible or impossible. We just say, God, what would you like us to do? So here I am. Lead pastor here. God, how, how, how would you like us to get out of debt? Chris, have a heart for the house. Here it is. Here's what you're going to do. Okay, that seems impossible. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to change it. God's like, no, don't change it. If you change it, you're taking me out of it. It'll no longer be unexplainable. You're trying to find a way to make it explainable. Stop trying to make God's miracles and what God wants to do explainable. Stop categorizing it as impossible. And if we just do what God says, because I've been asking you to ask God what to do here. And if we do what God says, then we get to sit back and we get to watch what he does. And that's, that's the part where we sit back and we say, okay, God, be unexplainable. I dare you. Come on. And that, that, that's a great position to be in because I don't have to make it happen. I just get to watch God make it happen. That, that's, that's the good thing about this. Now, in order for us to do this here, last week I spoke about something that resonated so much so that I, I felt like uh, that we needed to kind of address it again, address it a little bit more. Last week I talked about legacy, and this week I want to talk a little bit more about legacy. Legacy is, is that thing that, that we, we leave behind as we go on. Now, I want to clear this up. I want to make sure we understand what legacy is. It's the lasting impact and influence so an impact or an influence on somebody or something that they leave behind after they pass away or they move on. That, that's your legacy. After you pass away or you move on, that thing that you left behind is the legacy that you leave behind. And, you know, we, actually, most of us never even think about it. We don't think about what we leave behind. But it's what we leave behind here. A couple good quotes on this here. Uh, Billy Graham helps put this in really good perspective uh, for us as to what it is we want to leave behind here. The greatest legacy that one can pass on to one's children and grandchildren is not money or other material things accumulated in one's life. What's the thing that people fight over in the will? Money. What's the thing people fight over? Property. So what are those things that families get mad and split apart and bring lawyers into? Yeah, it's, it's money. Money's not bad, but it's when that's the only thing that we leave behind, that's a problem. And so what Billy Graham is saying here is that the most important thing is rather a legacy of character and faith. That, that's the greatest thing that we can leave our children, which is that next generation. Psalm 145 uh, or 154 verse 4 says, says this here in the Amplified. One generation shall praise your works to another. So it's talking about, let's, let's apply this to us. One generation is going to praise what God does here to another generation. One generation is going to praise because of the legacy to the next generation. 
One is going to praise to another. What are we leaving behind for them to praise? Well, here it is. And they shall declare that your mighty and remarkable acts. That's, that's what they're going to praise from one generation to another. Not our mighty and remarkable acts, but the mighty and remarkable acts that God does through us. See, what, what I love about this verse is I see our church in this verse here. Because as we talk about paying off debt, you know, I, yeah, that, that's a legacy building thing. And yeah, that sets up the next generation. That, that, that makes all of that, you know, very like valuable for the next generation. But really what it is, is it's just like the first, like one of the first times in four years that I've been here that I've said and that God has said, let's do something mighty and remarkable. And when we do the mighty and the remarkable, it's because we've heard what God said and we've done what God does and then we've watched what God does. Then a generation will praise that from next to the next to the next to the next. See, we get to leave this incredibly lasting impact. A a couple quotes that I've said the last couple weeks that have resonated with people really uh, a lot. So I thought I felt led to include them this week as well as what you inherit is not as important as what you leave behind. Okay, so let's think about your relationships in your family. Uh, You grow up under an abusive mom, dad, aunt, uncle. Uh, You grow up in an abusive relationship. You've inherited kind of an abusive relationship. You can't pick your family. You've you've entered into that. Now, what's what's more important for you? Is is it what you inherit or what you can change and you can leave behind? Because what you could do is you could say, you know what? I was given the short end of the stick. I was given a bad deal here. And because I was given the short end of the stick and a, and a bad deal, then I'm just going to end up repeating what happened before me. So abused people tend to abuse people. Alcoholics tend to produce more alcoholics. I, why, why, would the, why would the bad things be the things that get passed down? Well, because they're the things that get inherited. And when we don't have this mindset here, and a lot of people never think about this. And I mean, I only thought about it because of this message and this sermon series that I'm doing here. But what we inherit is not as important as what we leave behind. Meaning, if you inherit, just talking about these abusive parental relationships, but then you leave behind for the next generation, for your kids, a beautiful, happy family one that doesn't have abuse, or when you inherit alcoholism into your family and you're born into that, and then you leave that behind and you never touch a drop, then guess, see how valuable that is? That thing that you leave behind is so much more valuable than what you inherit. And that's the opportunity that we, that we have here as a church. But more importantly, apply this to your life. Think about, okay, what have I inherited and how can I change that so that I leave behind something even more valuable? And the thing that we leave behind, that, that which you leave behind you, will be seen as a reflection of you. I think about, um, you know, like a, a boat going through the water. It leaves a, a wake behind it. And that, that wake is the impact that you've made as you've, as you've puttered through life. And what, what does that wake look like? You know, when you turn around and you look behind you and you look at your life up to this moment here, what you see is not there because you're a victim. What you see is there because it's a reflection of you. And you've inherited, a lot of us have inherited a lot of bad things. But every single one of us also has the ability. And I'm I'm asking something from an unbelievable place of privilege. Okay, so... By no means am I trying to belittle your situation. I just want to encourage you, encourage you that you know that you can be an overcomer. And that when you look behind that legacy that's behind you, no matter what it is that you inherited, you see a reflection of you, but that reflection is a legacy that you're proud of and that you're happy with. One, one that you feel like you're handing off better than what you received. And speaking of handing things over, our, our legacy... Is not just limited to what we leave behind. Our legacy is also what we hand over. So it's not just what we leave behind, it's what we hand over. And you want to hand over something, you want to hand over something better than the way that you received it. 
you know, it was always so frustrating growing up when we would go on a family vacation. You know, again, very privileged here. We'd go on a family vacation, and before we would leave, we would have to clean the place, you know. And my, my, my mom, dad would say, hey, we want to leave it better than when we came. I'm like, well, that's dumb, you know. <laughs> Why don't we just leave it and let the, you know, let people, you know, clean it. Or when we would take youth out and take them on camps or take them away, we'd tell them, guys, we're going to be known, uh, and really, as a, as, a, as a youth leader, you're thinking, I hope they, ask us, they allow us to come back. And so we know we've wrecked the place, so we're going to leave the place better than the way that we found it. We're going to hand it over in better condition. You know, it's your legacy, it's not only what you leave behind you, but it's also what you hand over to the next generation, to the next people coming up. So let's talk about this generation thing. What is the next generation worth to you? To you, to me, to us. See, here's where the, the, here's where the, you have to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. However you answer this question has got to permeate and influence everything that we do. What is the next generation worth to us? What is the next generation worth to you? So if there's no value in the next generation, then there's no priority on the legacy that you leave. If you feel that there is a priority on the legacy that you leave behind, if you want to leave a better legacy behind you in spite of what you inherited, well, then that means the next generation has to be valuable to you. And so maybe if I can get us to understand that the next generation has the most valuable, the most, the, the most value that, that we could think of, then I, I feel like then I can help you understand how important the legacy is that you leave behind. Decision left that behind for them to pick up, and we've handed it over for some of them to take over directly from us. But the next generation, if it's worth everything, then that means that the legacy we leave is also worth absolutely everything that we have. Everything. But that's not the legacy that the world wants us to leave behind. I've had a hard time putting like a, a name to this, you know, next statement here. And I've been praying over this statement for a long time. For a long, long time. I feel like that the world, really the world wants to leave, the world wants us to either not leave a legacy or to leave a legacy of, of optionality, a legacy of having an option. Here, here's what that looks like. That which is optional for one generation is going to be seen as unnecessary to the next. So I'm gonna just let me say that again, because I want you to, because I want you to. I want, to, I want this to sink in. That which is optional for one generation, you guys sitting out there, is going to be seen as unnecessary for the next, your kids or those that are coming after this here. All right, now, here's the point where I'm, I want to step on some toes in the room here. All right, I hope you've got steel, you know, steel-toed boots on. If you're new, if this is your first Sunday, you can tuck your feet under the seat in front of you so that, you know, we can't, we can't get to them here. But just go ahead and get ready because I'm going to step on your toes this morning. You know, when th this is happening even here in church. Here here's why I know this. Because one Sunday, we'll have uh, 115 people here in the room. And then the next Sunday, we'll have 70 and then, then there'll be a couple Sundays of 80 or 86 or 90. Then there'll be one of 56. And then there'll be one of 115 again. What's going on there? See, what's going on there, I, and, and I, I know this because I hear it from people, is coming to church on Sunday, it's, it's an option. I can make the option of, okay, if, you know what? If I'm tired, I'm just going to lay in bed. You know, it's raining outside. We're not going to come. It's so weird that churches plan around the fact or the idea that if the surf is good and the weather is good, you can take your congregation and cut it in half. If it's raining outside, then you can expect 40% less people to show up to your church. If an event went on at the high school, the local high school, the, the Friday before, then you can expect you know, half or less than half of the people to show up again on a Sunday morning. And what's happening is you are creating uh, the optics that church is optional. And what's going to come out of that is the next generation is going to say, if it was optional to you, then I don't even think it's necessary for me. 
or it's easier for it to become unnecessary for me. And the, if, if I just continue on with the church attendance thing here, here's why that matters so much. It's because once a week, we have an opportunity here in this room and in our family ministry environments where all the kids are. We have a, an opportunity once a week to take away every, everything else, leave everything else out there at the door and come in here and try and have an experience with Jesus. You get once a week. Once a week that's offered. Once a week. And we miss that opportunity, not because, you know, our, our families decided to go to, uh, you know, to go camping. I'm not saying you got to be in church every week or else you're condemned or else you're living your life wrong. I'm saying that church has to be a priority because, not because I need your attendance, but because I know that 100% of the time Jesus is in this place. I know that 100% of the time Jesus wants to move in us. I know that 100% of the time, every child that walks through the door, we're going to put 100% of our effort into them hearing the truth about God's love for them. And we make it an option. You know, how, how, how we make tithing an option. We make serving an option. What are we leaving for the generation behind us? When's the last time your kids saw you tied, saw you pray together, saw you hold hands together? When's the last time your kids uh, saw you guys go on a date together? What, what, what are your kids seeing? Well, that's optional to mommy and daddy. That's, that's optional to the generation that I'm looking up to. So why is it necessary to me? Because they didn't think it was important enough to make sure we were there. So why is it necessary? I grew up old school in an old school Southern Baptist church. And in one of those churches, which we're, we're not trying to be here, you know, uh, it didn't matter how you felt on Sunday morning. I don't know if anybody else grew up with a mom like this. You know, my, my mom would, she'd put a chain around us and just drag us and chuck us into Sunday school and say, there you are, you know. I'd wake up in the morning and, uh, and I'd lay there, I'd lay there silently. And I would think like, okay, if I don't make a, and I'd pray. I'd be like, God, please, let us stay home. God, please, let us stay home. Let us stay home. Let me stay home and play. And I would just pray, and I'd watch the watch, and I'd, I'd wait to hear. You know, my mom wore a bracelet that had a bell in it, which was awesome. Because I always knew where she was in the house. <laughs> That's a bad parenting thing. And I would lay there and listen for the bell, and then I would, I would hear the family getting up, and I'd be like, I'm oh, going to church, you know. And we went camping, we did other things, but I knew that church was a priority, not an option. It was a priority. And if these things are not priorities to you, if your legacy is not building God as a priority, then the next generation we hand that legacy over to is going to have the world mixed in with it. It's going to have other influences mixed into it. And then they're going to say, ah, maybe it's not necessary for me. Because I had my mom and dad's faith, but w what about mine? This isn't about dragging you here every Sunday. It's not about my attendance numbers. It's not about making me feel good or making me feel complete. This is about you and the generation that comes after you. And if I truly believe that God comes every Sunday in this room for us, then how dare I not make a big deal out of this? Because what is optional for one generation will become unnecessary for the next. You know, this generation um, needs something to look to. This next generation does. And when the next generation looks to us as a legacy, when the next generation looks at what legacy, sorry, when the next generation looks at us, what legacy will they step into? When they, when they look at us, what will they step into? We can say things all day long, but what is it that we're doing? See, one, they could step into one that challenges and inspires, or they could step into a legacy that's full of problems that they have to solve. You know, we're there. So many of us are sitting in legacy right now, family, work, your own personal lives, your personal brokenness that you've inherited, and you're just solving problems from day one. Someone has handed over, Here, here's a life for you, and it's full of problems for you to have to solve. Guess what? That, stop, that can stop now with you. 
That can stop today. That process can start so that that stops and it doesn't get passed down to the next generation. So the legacy you leave is different. So that you leave something more important. You leave something that challenges and inspires rather than creates problems for them to solve. You know, another thing is that the next generation, they need to see that we believe so much that we do it. They need to see it, that we believe it so much that we do it. They may not believe. They may not. They may think all this is crazy. But they will watch us do And that can change and encourage them to believe. We can talk about being debt-free. We can talk about coming to church. We can talk about tithing. We can talk about serving. We can talk about all that stuff. But what is it that they're watching us do? Because they're going to become you one day. Uh, My son, Letha, he's 16. He's not here uh, this weekend, so I can can talk about him freely. Uh, Yeah, I know. You know, uh, so th- th- this can apply to all of us here. Um, you ever look at your parents you know, when you're younger and you think, these guys are just so dumb, you know? They don't have a clue, you know? They are dumb. They don't know. They don't understand the world. They don't get the way the world works. They don't understand, like, my music. They, they just don't understand it. You know, that, that, that's the way, like, the generation can, you know, your kids can look at you. But what's cool is, as a parent, eventually there will be a day where you will see your child do something just like you did. Uh, I'll tell you a personal example in, in my life. Uh, I'll tell you two examples. One, uh, our, our son Lifa, he is. He's super cool. He's super amazing. Casey and I did this really cruel thing where he got a pair of shoes. He got a pair of New Balance 550s, you know, it's all white, you know, looking looking good, feeling good about himself, and there was a place in the mall that had to buy one, get one free, and so Casey and I got the same shoe as him, and so that just like, he's like, that took away all the cool out of that shoe, and every time he wears it, well, hey, man, look at what I, you know, we just, we just, you know, we just do that, but what's cool is we're starting to see Leafa do things the way that, that I do things, some good, some bad, like right now, he's started to watch a lot of like true crime. And so now Leafa, which is my YouTube algorithm, it's like true crime, uh, machinery, um, 3D printing, you know, it's things, you know, things like that. And Leafa is now watching true crime and he's talking to me. He's like, hey, you know, I saw this case on, on this YouTube channel and, you know, can you believe this guy, you know, did that and that. And I just smiled <laughs> so big. I'm like, you're becoming me, you know, you're becoming me. And Casey just, you know, sits off to the side and is like, I have nobody in this, you know, in this house. See, your kids are going to do what they see you do. They're going to do what they see you talk about. They're going to they're gonna become you. There will be a day where they become, they become you, the good and the bad. And we've got to believe in the change so much so that they see that we do it. They, they've got to see that. You know, we've got to believe so much that, that like what God has called us to do that feels impossible, like paying the debt off at the end of the month, is actually just an unexplainable miracle that God's going to do. And if we believe it so much that we do it, imagine what the next generation sees in us as a church or sees in you as you sacrifice or sees in you as you gave towards it. Just imagine that. What kind of person will they become? Now, I've got some hopes some things that I want for the next generation. And I believe that our, our church does as well. I a few of them for you here. So what is it that we want specifically for the next generation? We want an unshakable faith. We want them to have an unshakable faith. We want them to be equipped to keep their faith after they leave our church. You know, we don't want them to have a faith that's built on a house of cards because when they leave the church or they leave your home or even they leave here and they go to school, They're going to have all kinds of other stuff bombarded at them. And when all that comes at them, what happens with their faith? Does it get shaken or does it stay unshakable? You know how we make sure that the next generation has unshakable faith? Is you have to do life with unshakable faith. You have to model it for them. They have to see you do it. That you believe in it so much that you do it. 
And even though they don't start out believing, they start becoming. And they start having the same unshakable faith. We, it, it, the world just wants to shake them around, you know? Take all the good stuff that you've spent 18, 19 years, 30 for some of you, pouring into your kids. The world just wants to strip all that out. But what, what I hope for the next generation is that they come away with an unshakable faith. You know, what if, what if God has given us uh, a gift? And this gift is to pay the debt off. You know, we, we, we think of that gift as like, you know, it's like, that's such a big gift, man. That's like, or such a big deal. That's a, like an impossible thing here. But here's, what if God is like, no, actually, that's this tiny, tiny little thing down here. It's not that big of a deal. Remember, I resurrected Jesus for you. And it's this, it's this down here. And God is saying like, hey, hey, South Point, can you do this? If you can do this down here. And then we, we do that down there. Because we, we have faith and we, we say, okay, God, we're going to do it. We hear what he, what he says and we do what he does and we watch then how, how he uses that. And then after that, th- get, guess what's cool about that is God then says, okay, now I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you another one. And then we do that one. I don't know what it'll be. I'm excited about it, though. And then God says, okay, you've done that one. Now let me give you this one over here. And then, <laughs> and then we do that one. You know, I believe that God looks down and is like, man, this church, like, I just keep giving them stuff. And then they just keep having faith and faith and faith and unshakable faith. And then imagine your kids come into an environment like this, or you invite your neighbors or friends into an environment like this, and they experience what it means to be a group of people that have unshakable faith. You know, pe- people coming to be healed, people coming for emotional and spiritual healing, people coming because, can you just, I, I don't know how to explain it, but I can see it. I can see that on the other side of this little thing that's two million rand is a bigger thing and a bigger thing and a bigger thing and a bigger thing. And you know what? In the next couple of years, I hope that we're standing on a ladder. And I hope that God is saying, build the scaffolding, guys, because I'm going to give you a lot. Because I trust you with a lot. And I see that you don't just talk about it, you do it. And we do it because of the legacy that we leave behind. It's not so that we're great. It's so that we leave behind the greatness of Christ. So that we hand over the greatness of Christ. The promises of Christ. But how does the next generation know what the promise of Christ looks like? If we don't do it and show them. That's our role. Now, I also want the next generation to have a faith that is tethered to the resurrection and person of Jesus. This is a faith specifically tethered only to the resurrection, not, not the Bible. That's why it's not called bible entity. It's called Christianity, because we, we don't tether our faith to the Bible. In the first service, when I said that, I felt like some tension in the audience, so I went to hide behind the TV and then I realized none of you carry Bibles. You all carry cell phones. And I thought, okay, throw your phones. I'll sell them. We'll get out of debt with that, you know. But God wants us to have a faith, and he wants the next generation to have a faith tethered only to the resurrection. See, when Christ died on the cross, King James did not teleport through space and time and come to the foot of the cross and write the Old Testament and the New Testament and put it all together and hand it over to Matthew and hand it over to the others and Paul and Peter and give it to them. And then when Jesus resurrected from the grave, they weren't all standing out there because it says it in the Bible there. And Jesus didn't go to them and say, I want you guys to turn to page 397 of your Bible and here's how you're going to go out and you're going to make a disciple. That, it's not the way that it works. They didn't even have a Bible. They didn't have a Bible for a long time. Their faith was tethered to one thing and one thing only. And that was the resurrection of Jesus. And if it worked for them, then it works for us. Now, I do not, I do not discredit the Bible in any way. I read it every day. And I love it. It is the living, breathing Word of God. But my faith is not tethered to it. My faith is tethered to the resurrection. And that's what we want for the next generation. Let me show you what happens here. This is so, this is, this is so cool. When, you, when we do things in line with Jesus, this is, this is so neat how this works out. If a student begins to lose their faith in the Bible, they don't have to lose their faith in the resurrection. Wow. 
They don't have to lose their faith in the resurrection while they tackle the hard questions of the Bible. Oh, my word. Can you imagine that? To have the freedom to wrestle with what's in the Bible, with theology, with all of that stuff. But your faith in the resurrection is not, is, is not is, you don't lose that. Ah. Man, to be a person and to produce a next generation that's so secure in the fact that Jesus died for them, that their salvation is in that, that they have a relationship with Christ, that they can freely wrestle with what's in God's word because they know who they are in Jesus. They know that their faith is tethered, tethered to the resurrection. And what's another thing that I want? I, I want for the next generation... I want a faith that shifts from just believing to following behind Jesus. It's very different to believe and to follow. Christ didn't say go out and make believers. Christ said go out and make followers. Christ said go and make disciples. A disciple is somebody that is following the ways of Christ. It's following after Jesus. You know, everybody, lots of people believe in, in Jesus. Satan believes in Jesus. The, the demons in the New Testament, there's accounts that you can read. When Jesus comes near them, they squeal and they screech and they say, get away from us, please. Demons believe in Jesus. Lots of people believe in Jesus. Some people believe in him just so they can hate him, but they believe in him. Some people believe in him so much that they can say he, he, he's unfair. You know, to call God unfair means that you believe that he's there. You know, believing is one thing, but then following is another. Believing doesn't lead to a legacy. Following leads to a legacy. It's following. Let me show you a quote here about pastors. Uh, you know, I, I'm in a job in a position that has one of the highest rates of moral failure, one of the highest rates of divorce. You know, do you th Satan doesn't want our family or us to, to do well and to survive this thing. Because if he can tear us down, he can split a church. And there's a quote from Andy Stanley as he worked with a lot of fallen church leaders. And he says, Every pastor failure is the failure of a man who believed correctly but had not been following for a long time. Every marital failure is the failure of a man or woman who believed correctly in Jesus, in marriage, in all that God said, but had not been following God for a long time. There's a big difference between believing and following. I, I, I want to end on one more thing here. Uh, and, and so our production team, this will be the last thing that we end with here. So I want to explain this to you. Jesus is more than just part of life. Jesus is the context that's applied to all of life. And here's the way, I, this came to me on the spot uh, in the first service, and I felt like it was good. A bit cheesy, but I'll use it with you guys. So when I take my glasses off, I can't see anything at all. Like, I can't see, I mean, I know that you're there, but I can't see any figure, like, you're just ghosts, you know? Um, so I can't see anything at all. If I put my glasses on, then uh, all of a sudden I can see you guys. Sometimes, I mean, you guys are pretty good looking, like you dress up well, and so it's nice to have glasses on. But uh, let's say that these glasses that I look through here, let's call these, it's going to be so corny, but just, hey, younger generation, this is one of those moments where you're like, this guy's a joke, you know? <laughs> just, just listen to me, okay? Just listen, all right? These are my Jesus glasses, okay? Yeah. Uh, listen, all right? These are my Jesus glasses. And th this is my not believing in Jesus glasses. These are my following in Jesus glasses, all right? So uh, I'm driving down the road, and a guy cuts me off, all right? So I don't have my Jesus glasses on, so what do I, what do I hypothetically, what do I do, you know? Flip him the bird. Ah, oh, it feels good, you know? It's crazy how much is in the middle finger, you know? It's like, ah, oh, <laughs> That feels so good. So, but I put these on. God cuts me off, and I think to myself, I wonder how his day's going. You know, I, I take these, I take off my Jesus glasses, and I'm working out in the gym. I'm, you know, a married man, and there's all this like temptation out there, and something in me just says, you know, walks up somebody and says, "Hey, I, I, I see you here often. You know, throw." 
one of Pastor Kyle's pickup lines out there, you know, which is 100% guaranteed to work. You know, but if I put these on right here, then when I'm in the gym, head down, honoring my wife at all costs, no matter what. You know, as a high school student, you take these off, looking to date somebody. Your parents tell you to date a, somebody that loves Jesus. And you're like, yeah, 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 you know, that's in there. You know, yeah, it's in there. But they look really good, you know. But if we teach the next generation to view through the context of following, not believing, but following, then the next generation puts these on and they say, I'm going to hold out for somebody that also is in love with Jesus. That's what we want for this next generation. That they look at everything through the context of following Christ. So let me ask you one more time here. What is the next generation for us worth? It's worth everything. And it's time that we do so that they know what to follow. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the word that you've given. We thank you, Father, for uh, the value that you've put on the next generation, for entrusting us to it. Father, I pray that my words went out and they fell on fertile ground. I pray that you open up everyone's heart and eyes and ears and that people just see you. Father, I, I, in Jesus' name, I banish guilt or condemnation and we chuck it out of this building. Father, there's nothing but room for your love here. Your room and your conviction, which draws us to you. So, Father, move through this room. Father, I love you. It is unexplainable how much you love me, and I'm so thankful that I can't explain it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.